Today's me editing Where are the Basically, it's a C-SPAN situation. If you watch them on C-SPAN, that's a static. They might move in the show. Some people must have static here. Hey, Ross. Hey, I'm going to spit tea out, Bobby. That was clear. I believe it. That was clear. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to Wave Riders. I'm Russ Lay, uh, co owner of the Outer Banks Voice. My partner, Rob Morris, raise your hand. The other co owner of the Outer Banks Voice. And we're doing this in conjunction for the second time with Milepost Magazine. Uh, Matt Walker, where are you? I saw you in the There you are, Matt Walker. Uh, I'm just going to introduce some people here and then I'm going to turn it over to Sam Walker, who everybody knows. He's the real star these days with his, with his radio. Um, I would say be natural. Uh, uh, the, the camera's here, but be natural. It's a conversation. Look at each other. Um, <laughs> Let me introduce some people that are here, uh, elected officials and candidates. Uh, Wally Overman, Dare County Board of Commissioners. Rob Ross, Dare County Board of Commissioners and a candidate. Uh, John Winley, Kildova Hills Board of Commissioners. Uh, Irvin Bateman, uh, Kildova Hills, uh, Kitty Hawk, Kitty Hawk Board of Commissioners and a candidate for Board of Commissioners at Dare County level. Terry Gray, Kildova Hills. <laughs> Susie Walters, NAG's Head Commissioner and Vice Mayor. Uh, Ann Patera, <laughs> Vice Board of Commissioners, Republican. Um, Carol Warnecke, Board of Elections. <laughs> Jen Alexander, Board of Education, District 2. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Walker's capable hands now. Again, thank you everyone for coming. This is the second time we've done it and we're really excited and we're going to do this again in November for the general election, so be ready. Mm -hmm. Okay, enjoy. Uh, the kitchen's closed, but enjoy yeah. beverages. And remember to check your weight down. He says, Mr. Walker, I'm looking around for Sam Walker Jr. to walk in with his beard. Oh, well, y'all have to do this. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I did want to bring up two points. The Democratic candidates for State House and Senate were invited. Um, Tess Judge is out of town uh, on a uh, uh, church convention meeting. Uh, Cole Phelps was going to be here up until about 11 o'clock last night. Now that he does not have a primary candidate, a primary opponent, he's now unopposed, even though there is going to be someone's name on the ballot and about votes are not going to count. We do know now that the appeal process time has expired for that uh, eligibility challenge that took place and there's no longer a second viable candidate. So Cole Phelps will get the nomination for state senate in District 1. Uh, he was going to attend, he decided to decline because he didn't want to interfere or get in the way. He felt like so. Um, so that's that's where the status of those other two legislative camps because they're going to be running in November. So uh, I think everyone here knows who we have. Of course, we have uh, Representative Bob Steinberg from Edenton, Craig County Commissioner Chairman, Craig County Commissioner Chairman Bobby Hanning, who's running in the state house race. Representative Beverly Boswell from Killable Hills and Park Street from Kitty Hawk. Um, they kind of, you guys kind of worked out perfectly how I wanted to see it. I didn't even <laughs> next so, so. Let's get going. First topic economic development and economic disparity in your districts. And obviously, the Senate district, we'll start Clark since you're right here. We'll start in the Senate district because it's 11 counties and what matters and what's important and what's going on in Hertford County and what's going on in Dare County are two opposite ends of the pole. Trying to find that balance. Clark, how do you feel like you as a state senator can achieve or help achieve that <coughs> goal of bringing more economic balance to all of Northeastern North Carolina? Hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> let me get the nerves out of my system right now. It's kind of weird to sit in front of everybody. So as we know, we've got a district in Northeastern North Carolina right now that has seen some uneven economic growth in the past several years. No surprise to any of us. We look at the traffic on Dare County and the traffic further west, and it's a big difference. So what do we need to do to try to fix that for each and every one of our families and our children? 
And I think one of the things we have to do is we begin by educating folks across the state of North Carolina that we're a little bit different, and that's no surprise. We need to educate the folks in Raleigh and Charlotte that we're important, but we're not Raleigh and Charlotte. In fact, we don't really gravitate to Raleigh and Charlotte. How many folks used to do their Christmas shopping up at Greenbrier Mall before Amazon? How many folks were born in Virginia Beach or when you go to a doctor's appointment, you go to Chesapeake, or you take your pets to Chesapeake, or you take your kids to Chesapeake. My little girl, when we go to the doctor, we go to Children's Hospital, the King's Daughters. And I think as a region, we need to orient to not Raleigh, but Hampton Roads. I think we need to make sure that our biggest industries are understood as not a Dare County industry. At the place I work, our average weekend worker drives 84 miles round trip to come to work. And they come from places like Camden and Pasquotank and Chowan and Currituck. It's a regional industry that we have in tourism. And I think we need to do two things. We need to educate everybody that we orient to Hampton Roads. For those of you who didn't know, Virginia Beach is the biggest city in Virginia, and we're just down the street from it. And then I think we need to educate everybody across the state of North Carolina that tourism is not a Curry Tuck County and Dare County phenomenon. It's a Northeastern North Carolina phenomenon. And so are our watermen, and so is our agriculture, and I think that's important. That's all my political speech right there. Sam, how did I do? Right. Let's see how <laughs> Mr. Steinberg, Representative Steinberg, and yes, apologize if I use first names. Uh, it's, fun, you know, it's, a, it's a casual conversation. Just hanging out, most friends hang out. In, in your time in the legislature, you've had to work with this, with trying to balance a district that is a, a little bit more compact. How do you feel like trying to balance those needs have, have gone so far? Trying to get what the people in the western part of the Albemarle need and what the eastern part of the Albemarle need. How do you feel like you've done? Okay, well, in District 1, the, uh, the district that I represent is currently six counties in northeastern North Carolina. Pretty compact, but we have made great progress within those six counties. This is going to be a little bit more challenging in this 11 county district in the Senate because it is the largest district in the entire General Assembly, in land mass. It will be equal in population to all other Senate districts, but it is going to, in land mass, be the largest. It looks like a King's Land Grant, if you look at it in the map. Very difficult to travel for, you know, just campaigning and trying to get everywhere you need to be to campaigning, to be at the conventions and so on and so forth. It is constant, constant, constant. But by being out there and being among the people, a lot of the things that they are confronted with and the challenges that they have are pretty much the same. Dare and Currituck somewhat different, but we're taking steps to do what we can to bring industry here. We had a great development that came here just recently announced over in Edgecombe County, which is part of the east, just adjacent to the district that I represent. A big, major Chinese tire manufacturer is coming here. It's creating four or 500 jobs at the average of uh, Forty-five to $55,000 a year. And one of the great things about that particular facility and that enterprise is that it doesn't stop there. When you get large manufacturers that, and we're beginning to feel the trickle of the good stuff that has happened in the major urban areas is starting as it always does, the rural areas are the last folks to experience it. This is a great step for us to have someone, a company of this size and magnitude, come into Eastern North Carolina. Now, it doesn't stop there, as I have mentioned. One of the great things about having a very large company come in is that those companies demand that those people who supply them, who bring them, who make components for whatever it is that they do, those factories have to be located by mandate by mandate, within an hour or 75 or 80 miles of the, uh, of, in this case, the tire manufacturing plant. So what you have is you have these jobs being created, and then like tentacles reaching east or west, but hopefully east, you're going to have all of these other companies that are going to be locating here as well. Not because they necessarily want to, but because they have to. And so that is a great thing. It's not just these 500 jobs, these 500 jobs are going to be get another 100 jobs, another 150 jobs, and so on and so forth. But talking about jobs in this region, there is a, there is a critical component, and that is the community colleges 
that we have here, and ours is the College of the Alma Mater. Now, you know, the nice thing about community colleges is that they, when a new business comes in, they can go to the community college and they can say, we need to have people trained to do this, this, and this. Unlike a four-year university, a community college can just like this within two weeks can have that program in place and can have it on the ground. That's what companies want to see. Now, I was a little disappointed uh, in the last legislative session when we tried, uh, and I tried as hard as I could, uh, to get community college money from uh, money from the NC Connect bond over here to expand both the COA campus in Currituck and the COA campus in Dare County. Well, I was away for the last four days of the session because my wife's sister died of pancreatic cancer at 62 years old. But on the way to New York to her funeral, I was working right through the night till 2 a.m. in the morning, and the last bill to pass at night was this bill that approved for Currituck County only approved the money so that this school could expand and offer a new program for first responders in a new facility. One of the things that I just cannot understand, I'll never be able to understand it for the life of me, we were trying to do the same thing for Dare County, but it never happened in Dare. I was being blocked in Dare. Even when I tried to get the legislation done to get the money from the NC Connect, which required a lot of maneuvering just to make this happen, because this has never been done before. This was a precedent. precedent. I had people blocking me from even allowing that to happen. So, unfortunately, you needed a new campus out here. You wanted a new campus. We weren't able to make that happen. We weren't able to thread the needle. The last bill that was passed, we got it in Currituck. Thanks be to God. I'll continue to try to help you to get this thing straightened out here in Derrick County. Well, let's, and, and I want to carry that over because responsible for that was something that was a, a topic of discussion. Uh, I know you guys aren't running against that. You work together in the legislature. Sure. But I, I want you to answer for that. I did not say answer that. That's not the way to put it. Describe what happened with that and why you felt like it was more important to get Curry Tuck first and then come back to Derrick County later. Or was that exactly what you wanted to do? Uh, as far as the COA situation. No, that wasn't my bill, so why he thought it was more important than her type? Well, no. yeah, well first so of all, what happened there. First of all, I was not privy to the bill, and I was never spoken to about it until the last minute during crossover week. And uh, there was no, well, and to this day, there's still not an RFP to start work there in her type, even though the time is of the essence. I uh, never had an MOU, never had an MOA, so there was no guarantee what was going to go on. And if I want something, I want something here in the Dare County campus, but I want the MOAs, and I want the MOUs, and I want the RFPs, and I want to go by the state bond rules that says you have to go by rules and regulations that go through the state. All right, well, let's on to stick with you, uh, Representative Boswell, because you're talking about economic development and trying to find it with a district that's going to change for you. And it's going to be an evolving district, a much more, a, a much different district than what you were dealing with before. Um, how do you feel like trying to find that balance between what's different in Pamlico County and what's different in Currituck and what's different in Hyde and there? What, how do you think of trying to bring them closer together or more and bring that economic development, bringing those economic opportunities? They're more alike than different. Uh, they still have the same wants and needs as everybody else, infrastructure. And you know the DOT has been very good to us in Eastern North Carolina these past the past few years, and we need jobs 24/7, not just jobs for tourists. You know during tourism season, I think we need to continue to deregulate the um, regulations that have burdened the small businesses. And I passed a bill that would give the small businesses a tax break. And that, as you can see, is a proven um, spur to the economy because we are going way, way up and welcoming businesses, just like Representative Steinberg said. So what we need to do is concentrate on lowering our taxes, 
concentrating on deregular lading and welcoming these businesses here. Also, we've got to continue to work with our commercial fishermen. We were able to stop a, a bill that would have been detrimental, detrimental to all of us because once again, it's just not fishermen. They go, we have workers that come from Hyde. We have workers that come from Perta, Dare, even Washington County. So it's a ripple effect when you close an industry down or you limit what they're doing. So and we're working a lot on their culture. We passed a lot of bills on that, which includes Pamela Co. And they're very well aware of that. And also agriculture, we've done a lot of work in that as well. So, like I said, we're more alike and with the deregulations and the welcoming of new businesses and the beach nourishment that we've been um, working on. I think we're moving forward and we're going to continue to do that work. Bob, you've been directly in that aspect, being in a single county that's in the district that both um, Representative Steinberg represents and Representative Boswell wants to represent. How do you feel things have gone in Raleigh trying to find that balance on getting hurry up the separation that exists between Koala and the mainland. Kind of almost an example of the separation between some of the counties in this district. How do you feel like things have gone right? How do you feel like you can make a change? Uh, I think the number one word and the number one incentive needs to be diversity. Uh, we consistently push to have a more diverse economy. Primarily, I've worked in hurry up. Um, the the current up. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm he sorry. The, uh, the mainland, uh, we have consistently pushed for diversity, trying to be, bring businesses there. Uh, I think the Pamlico and Hyde County regions, farming is the number one industry there. We need to keep promoting our farming industry. We need to encourage farmers to farm. <laughs> our commercial fishing, oystering is big in Hyde County. It's, it's the fastest growing industry in eastern North Carolina. We need to keep promoting that. That will, that will bring jobs, that will bring stability to the region. Um, I've often said that we are one major storm away from being a Hyde County or a Pamlico County, and we have to be prepared for that. We are not prepared for that. We need to be able to sustain ourselves for the long haul, and it's very important that we encourage those types of jobs and those types of industries. Um, with that said, with economic development, uh, also comes a critical situation that exists uh, throughout the world, throughout the country, throughout the state, and throughout every county in the state. That's affordable housing. It doesn't seem the private sector is in our two counties, and I would say our two counties, our two counties we cover, which is Curry, Tuck, and Dan, that the private sector is stepping to the plate. They're not stepping to the plate. The local governments are being looked to. How do you feel like looking do you think the state government needs to step down? I'm going to start with you, Bobby, and we'll work back down. <coughs> uh, it's, it's going to take some political will. Uh, you know, Curica <coughs> is, is very, very growing very quickly. And the worst thing that I could have possibly said when I first ran for commissioner was, I want to see affordable housing. I got 20 phone calls that day. Have you lost <laughs> your mind? We do not want affordable housing in Curica County. But that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a lot of political will from Raleigh from every county in this region. We have to understand that folks cannot afford to live in a $400,000 house, and we have to make arrangements for that. I understand Dare County is ex extremely, I'm gonna say right at the 90% built on buildable land in Dare County. Uh, I know there's land west of there, perhaps some, some, some arrangements can be made in the Stumpy Point region. It isn't that far, we can make arrangements for that. Currituck County, uh, we have, uh, there have been, <laughs> Sorry. There, that's, that's quite all right. So my, my beeped on Bob, we're good. <laughs> uh, in in, in Currituck County, we are, we are slowly allowing for multiple family homes. This allows teachers to come into the area where they can live in an affordable housing situation. Uh, affordable housing is not the word to put out to the general public. We need to be building houses people can afford. There's a big difference. Uh, so encouraging that is going to be crucial going forward in the very near future. And I think we need to allow for that. Uh, Representative Boswell, what are your thoughts on the state getting involved in this? Because it seems like the counties are struggling to answer for it. And 
private sector just doesn't seem to be stepping to the plate. I believe in the free market, and I believe in working together with your constituents and working together with um, the population group. And perhaps if that is a need and we can have a builder or a contractor or someone that owns property that is willing to build that and have affordable housing, that should be available. Do I think that we should force the government to step in and take over housing? No, I don't believe so. Do I think we should encourage them and have a partnership? I'm willing to do any partnership and willing to have that conversation, but I don't think that uh, it should be a law that we have to force people to build affordable housing. I believe in private property rights, and they should build as according to what they want to build. But incentives? I'd be glad to sit down and talk to them because, yeah, we do need some affordable housing everywhere, not just here, not this district or this county. There's not even affordable housing in Raleigh. So that is always a question, and that's always open on the table, and I've not known anyone to turn their back. They're always willing to talk about that and help. Like my children graduate from college, they can't come back here and even rent a home because that's an outrageous amount of money here. But am I willing to talk about it, about <coughs> a private partnership, but a subsidy? That's going to be a big, a big leap. Free market is where we're at, and we've got to start from there and get these builders interested. And then that'll be their investment, their investment in the community, and that's where it starts. Representative Steinberg? Yes, uh, well, the uh, infrastructure obviously is very, very important. I met with the Dare County home builders the other day, a couple days ago, and uh, this was one of the topics that we talked about. This is something that is not just facing Dare County, although I think it's probably more amplified in Dare County, but uh, a lot of places, even Edenton, there, there are unaffordable uh, homes in Edenton. We have to support our infrastructure. Our policemen, our firemen, our teachers, all of these folks who support the infrastructure itself, they need to have a place to live so that they can go back and forth. What we're going to have to see here is, uh, and a lot of it has going to fall on the shoulders of the local, the county commissioners and the local towns and so on and so forth, they are going to have to work together as it relates to zoning issues and being able to put housing, uh, make housing available that is going to be able to provide a roof, bed, etc., for these people who are essential to keeping our economy going here. You don't have these folks. I don't care how great tourism is. You don't have these folks. And no place to live. It's it, it's going to end up being an absolute disaster. So uh, I believe that uh, we need to have all of the stakeholders at the table. And uh, the state certainly can play, can perhaps play a role in this. But I think first and foremost, the builders need to be talking with their commissioners, need to be talking with their town commissioners, and there needs to be a plan, there needs to be a plan, at least a prototype, as to how we can begin to start addressing this. Because if it is not addressed now, and with prices on homes the way they are now and escalating, it's only going to get worse. So now is the time, as Golda Meir used to say, the time is now. And, and as far as that issue is concerned, the time is now. And the builders feel it. They know it. They know there's a lot of pressure on them to try and comply with this, but they're going to need the help of many of these folks here who are county commissioners and uh, town commissioners and so forth. Stuart, so you kind of directly related to this question because of your business so in, in one aspect of how about what you think we could do differently as a state senator to find this find this ability to get affordable housing in this part of the state yeah guys it's no big surprise i read an article in the triangle business journal a couple of months ago that said the outer banks was the most expensive place to live in north carolina and let's talk about affordable housing let's look around this room look at the average age in this room where are all the young people and the answer is they're not here because they have a hard time affording to live on the Outer Banks. And when we talk about young people, we talk about families and jobs. And we talk about how do we make housing affordable. And you're right, it's hard to make any money building affordable housing because the rent levels are right at what it costs to build it. By the time you actually go build it, you don't make very much money. 
and we have some density challenges right now zoning urban you're probably aware in Kitty Hawk right now we do have some zoning challenges out there how do we talk about density when we talk about affordable housing and then a housing that working families can live in and afford we've got an issue there we've got some infrastructure challenges there and then ultimately we've got an issue with how do we make it attractive to business and I've seen historic preservation work with incentives in the past there are ways I think to make it more attractive ultimately it doesn't come down to housing and this is one of those weird things ultimately it comes down to people and it comes down to people agreeing on what's most important but I think in Dare County and Currytuck County if we went across the room one of the things we could all agree on is that there's not a person in this room who thinks their rent or their mortgage is cheap we all work hard for that and gosh we wish it were lower and how do we make that more affordable for the people who aren't in this room and I think the way to do it is there's some government not much but there's some there's a lot of relationships with employers and job creators the Department of Education has had success with it some of our industries have had success with it go to Corolla right now and tell me where when you go to Corolla and you buy something or you order something from a restaurant the person you're ordering it from is probably in some kind of affordable housing via their employer in Dare County too. And I think that's important for us to come together and say, let's agree as a community and as a group of people at the commissioner level, but also private employers, because that's where the jobs are that these young people are working in. Let's agree it's important and let's agree to go make it work somehow. And I do think there's a government role, but first and foremost, it's a young people role. And we've got to get them here in this room tonight and listen to them. Well, let's move on to another topic. We'll start with Representative Boswell. The brunch bill is an example of something that was done to roll back regulations on business in North Carolina. There's another one that someone brought up with us, and Matt and I talked about this. And Matt's, I, both of us had a situation. We have young daughters. Mine just turned 16 not too long ago. He's got a daughter. Can't get a job in a restaurant in North Carolina that serves alcohol until you're 16. You can't be a dishwasher. Not talking about working front of the house, talking about working back of the house. We're talking about trying to encourage economic development, trying to encourage kids to stay in Torrey Tuck and Dare and Hyde and Hertford County and Women's County to work, to get a job, to stay at home. Is that something that you would support, is to push for something like that? Talking about rolling back more regulations on business, finding a way to, bring, to, to, to again, roll back regulations? Absolutely. Um... I have a young son at home, and fortunately, he has a job at the Pup Cup. He, he's worked there throughout um, high school, and he's a student at COA. He's been there for two years, and he's still at Pup Cup. So once you find that job, you got to hold on to it because it's been a good job. He also happens to be a great worker. He has good work ethics. Uh, but absolutely, I think that our, our young need to learn how to go to work, have a good work ethic, and that have, that teaches them basic economics. They can have their own spending money and have fun, but we do have industries that they can work in where they'll be safe. Like, for example, there are restaurants here, a few granted, that don't have alcohol, and there are other tourism jobs as well, and with the hotels and so on and so forth, but I am always open to getting our young out and work because I have seen my son who was shy and introverted like his mother he's come forth and opened up and he's been able to communicate with a lot of people on a lot of different levels so I, it's good for year round I mean these kids think they're diverse because they see something on the computer and they think they're so in the know but no it's those skills those life skills that they need and I'm an absolutely 110 percent behind letting our youth work and get out and enjoy life and see what it's really about before they go away to school and are not prepared and pretty shocked when they get there. So yes, I'm more than open for that. Bob? Uh, I'm with Bob. 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 I'm Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does take some parent involvement. Uh, it's a different world than it was when I was 16 years old. And it takes the parents being involved with these kids to make sure that these restaurant owners and these people that are a little bit older than these kids aren't influencing them in, a, in the wrong way. 
uh, I guess I am all for kids going to work when they're 16, working in restaurants or wherever else they can work. Uh, my daughter uh, applied for a job at Wave Riding Vehicles when she was 16 and thought she had the job and and, and realized that Wave Riding Vehicles doesn't hire until they're 17. Well, you know, that, that doesn't help my daughter and that doesn't help the economy and I, I, I am totally against that. I, I think kids can even start working when they're 15. Kids can start working when they're 15. Uh, they're responsible, they want to work, they want to earn money, they want to get their car when they turn 16. They want to be able to pay for insurance. And that will do nothing but help our parents and, and everyone involved. So yes, I'm all for that, absolutely. I, I think the brunch bill uh, changed everything. Everything changed when that bill was passed. Uh, some of the uh, protocols that we had in place before as it relates to child labor and so forth, obviously we're going to have to take another look at. I, I think that uh, this is generally speaking true of almost any legislation. You put it in, you put it in with the best of intentions, but then you find out a year later, well, wait a minute, what about this? And, and what about this? So this is one of those four instances. I think one of the things that we have to be very careful about, though, I'm all for uh, providing these jobs, and even in these establishments, some of these establishments, maybe not all, I don't know about Hooters, but, uh, <laughs> but some of these establishments, but 16-year-old uh, boy in Hooters could be very dangerous. <laughs> but, but in any event, uh, I, I believe that we're going to have to take a, you know, take a, a, a look at this, obviously, to create uh, opportunities for them. But I think then there has to also be some parameters as it relates to the hours that they are working. You don't want these 16-year-old kids in these establishments where alcohol is being served late at night. Uh, so you know, the uh, what we can do is we can, if we look at this, we decide to make some changes. I think we can implement some protocols that will do. Uh, everything we can do to give these kids the chance to go out and make a living, save college savings account, whatever, but also, also to make sure and ensure that they are going to be protected. No, I, I don't have a problem with the guys. I grew up washing dishes at the Blue Point. I worked for John Powers and Sam McCann. Went there five, six days a week. I bought a Pontiac Bonneville with all the money I saved, <laughs> and it was beautiful. And I never had a drop of alcohol there. And you know why? Because my mom and dad would not have gone along with that when I'd have gotten home because dad picked me up at the end of every day. So I have no problem putting young folks to work in our service industry. That's cool right over there. It's full of beer. It doesn't bother me a bit. So, but I think we still need to have some acknowledgement of responsibility. That if we've got something in a, in a shop or a store that's not fit for everybody, we need to acknowledge there's some kind of responsibility there. But I also want our young folks to have a chance to go buy a Pontiac Bonneville. I don't think we should deny them that. So that's important. Um, there's another related topic on low and back regulation, and that's tax reform that's going on in North Carolina small businesses. But some small businesses didn't get that tax reform. And I'll be honest, one of them was ours. Um, about, you know, 50, and I'm, I'm taking, I've got notes scattered everywhere, so bear with me. So. But basically, you know, the $50,000 exemption for LLC partners was revoked when it cut the income tax a few years ago. So for some small business owners, it matters with tax income. Thousand dollars annually. Um, Starbird, how would you address that? Is that something that could be addressed in the short session? Is it something that you'd be willing to address uh, long term? Well, the the primary goal of the General Assembly has been, since the majority has changed, it has been to work toward eliminating eliminating the North Carolina state income tax. It has been reduced dramatically. We are continuing to cut the income tax. The thinking behind all of that was this would give us a very distinct advantage over our competing states, Virginia and South Carolina. It's going to draw a lot more interest and attention to North Carolina. I will point to Florida. I will point to Texas. I will point to Tennessee. And if you look at all of those states who have initially started reducing their state income tax and then eliminated their state income tax, they are all working like crazy now. Things are going well, the states are doing well, as is North Carolina, number one state to do business in, ranked by Forbes magazine. So obviously these things we're doing are absolutely critical and they, were, they are bringing results to the state and to the populace. 
with any piece of legislation, with any bill, with any tax reform, you're going to have winners, you're going to have losers. That's just the way it is. And uh, there are certain things, though, that I think we do need to take a look at. And one of the things that came out, not just at this meeting with the Deer County Builders, but one of the things that came out of uh, uh, our tax reform was this tax on labor. It is so confusing, people can't decide what's supposed to be taxed, what isn't supposed to be taxed. I don't think we've done a very good job of making that clear. And that is uh, what you have when you get into a situation like that, you have no compliance. Because if people don't understand it, they're not going to comply. Uh, I don't encourage anybody not to comply, but that's the facts. They don't comply because they don't, they don't get it. So we need to do whatever we can do to clarify, obviously, that component of tax reform. We can take a look at any individual situation and how it, it might be impacting any subset. But the fact of the matter is you will never have tax reform. You'll never have any legislation of any kind where everybody is going to say it's a winner. It's just not the way it works. Mark, what do you think about trying to find that tax reform, uh, especially for small businesses? Absolutely, guys. As we know, we love small, lower taxes. Who in the room doesn't love lower taxes? Everybody does. So I think the general rule was lower the rates and broaden the base. And that's what we tried to do. Now, as, as that happened, we all go down to Hutchins Canning and we file our taxes. And like any good CPA, what they'll say is, we don't understand the new rules. So what's the CPA going to say? Pay everything. That's what a CPA is going to say, and that's what they should say. Now, the local business person doesn't like to hear that. I don't want to pay, I have to pay a nickel more than I have to, because I want to pay other people that money. So what I think happened when we broadened the base was we began to tax things that we hadn't taxed before. And we didn't really define what those things were. And when we began to get feedback from our CPAs and around our dinner tables, then we had to call back to Raleigh and say, hey, wait a second, you're taxing our linens. Guys, that linen tax increase in Dare County was enormous. And we had to go fix that with folks in the General Assembly's help. Thank them for doing that. That saved jobs in Dare and Currituck County. So I think we've got to go down this road. I think it's a really important road. I think when unintended consequences do happen, and they always will, being perfect is not given to any of us. We need to very quickly be able to give feedback to Raleigh, and then the folks in Raleigh be able to work with folks like the Department of Revenue to offer clear guidance to CPAs who allow employers and people to put more money in their pocketbooks and in their businesses. What's the boss? As you know, I've passed legislation to lower the tax bill, and I'm sorry that you weren't part of that. But it's a work in progress, like everything else is. Yes, I'm always excited to work with uh, other legislators and try to tweak our bills. Just like Clark was saying, um, I worked almost three to four months fixing the unintended consequences of the double taxes of the women. And it's very complicated. It's so complicated. I had to sit down with several senators and several House members for that length of time to explain that, no, they're going to pay their taxes. We just don't want to pay them to pay it twice. Because we don't want those unintended consequences to shut down our small businesses, which is our life's blood in North Carolina, as you all know. So tweaking our taxes is something we're always going to do. We're always open to it because we want to continue to welcome our small businesses, our mom and pops. That's who we are in North Carolina, and I'm very proud of that legacy. And you watch, you see the same families working in the same place year after year, and it's a very nice thing. But I, we are always happy to cut those regulations. And as for the taxes debacle, I've had several people and several CPAs call us. And we did have to talk to legal, and we did have to define some things and help all these people trying to pay their taxes, because I don't want you to pay a dollar more, and I certainly don't want to pay a dollar more. So we are always working on that, and we're going to continue to. And I look forward in the short session of working with that. Mr. Hanning, I think this is probably the most directly one up here that's a small business owner that this directly is. Do you feel like the changes have been for good, and do you feel like you can make better changes? Uh, the, the first thing we have to do is look at the labor tax. 
Uh, we, we as a small business owners are struggling day in and day out. It isn't just the labor, it's what do you charge tax for? Okay, you replace a hot tub, do you pay tax for that? Do you pay tax on the wire for it? It creates an accounting nightmare. I get consistent calls from contractors that do home repairs or do uh, build entire new homes. If they buy a box of nails and they use it half on a remodel and half on a new construction, what do they do with the box of nails? Who do they charge it for? Uh, that entire bill needs to be looked at and revised. That is crucial, crucial, crucial to all of the small businesses anywhere you go. I am a small business owner. The first thing I'm going to do at Raleigh is give myself a tax break. Just kidding. Just kidding. Everybody lighten up. Lighten up. Uh, it, it is important. Uh, we have to continue to help our small businesses. They are the lifeblood of this entire country. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have started two very successful businesses in Kurtz up in Dare County. I know the trials and tribulations they go through, and I'm very intimate with their issues. So it's important for me to look at those tax issues and to get that straightened out and get it going forward. Teacher salaries, and two folks sitting in the middle can announce that they've got teacher salaries, average teacher salaries in North Carolina, $50,000. But some would say that that's $50,000 with a lot of help from local counties. Some would say. Some would say that a lot of help. So that, so with the, some of the counties have had to help get that with some. Um, and I'll start with you, Representative Boswell. How can North Carolina and you stay in the legislature, how can you help to continue that salary growth for teachers as we move forward now that we've hit $50,000 for something? Fortunately, uh, we have been doing a good job in Raleigh and we have a game plan every year to take a look at our teacher salaries and our um, try to offset some of the subsidies from the county because I truly understand those issues as well. But in and looking at their packet that they are offered every year, which includes insurance and so on and so forth, uh, there are already things in place to continue, as we have promised, to continue to uh, have their packet and their pay increased every year. Is it, We have to do everything in small increments. We just can't take that leap. They were so far down in the hole. We've had to get up out of the hole, literally, and get above water, above ground, and then start going up. But our teacher pay, we have already promised, and we're delivering on their um, sa average salary every year. And we have no intentions of stopping that because we value our teachers and we value our school system. Ms. Hattie, you have to deal with the budget that, uh, from, that comes from the Board of Education from the White House. They call it the White House in Curry Tuck because it's the old nap teacher. <laughs> and they call the White House in Korea. That's the White House in Korea. Um, but you get a budget from them every two years, every year, that costs, they need more to supplement to keep teachers in Korea Tuck from going to Chesapeake, going to Virginia Beach, going to Dare County. Um, how do you feel like you could make a change being in the legislature? The, the teacher salaries are coming up. Uh, the one word I want to say here is the lottery. Who here thought the lottery was going to save education? I, I, I was a little bit naive. Uh, there, we need to rely on our state to bring us more funding. The counties are continually increasing the amount of money they give to our schools and to our school systems. And we need, we need to work together to bring that up and to have a little bit of cooperation in that. Uh, our teachers are our first line of defense. When our children leave our house, we count on our teachers to take care of our children. But we need to make sure our teachers are taken care of. And that is very important to me. Uh, I know a lot of teachers. Uh, my daughter just graduated last year. And, and we need to really increase what we do for our teachers. It isn't just about the supplements. You know, in, in Currituck and Dare County, teachers move here for an environment. And, and that's important to folks. They don't move here just to make a living. They, live, they move here for a way of life. But we need to take care of those folks, and that's what's important. Mr. Steinberg, you've got a district that has probably some of the best and some of the worst performing schools in North Carolina, unfortunately. And not, not the just absolute worst, not the absolute worst, absolute worst <laughs> but it's pretty, it's pretty clear. And I'm not just talking about performance. Performance is tied to economics. Performance is tied to funding, capital expenditures, and teacher salaries. 
How, as moving into the Senate, do you feel like you can expand and keep teacher salaries growing, but keep teacher salaries growing in places like Elizabeth City and Edenton and, um, and, and Hertford and Windfall, those schools there who are struggling to keep teachers while they're still performing. We've got some schools that actually perform pretty well for equipment. But you've got Elizabeth City that really does have some issues that you've got to do. How do you feel like you can continue to grow that to keep those counties in balance with these? Well, well, one of the things, let me say this first of all, that uh, one of the things that has helped in my particular district uh, raise the level, if you will, of the scores, even in some of those low performing schools, is school choice. When school choice appeared on the horizon, all of a sudden the expectations for the, for the public schools had to be raised because now there was competition for students. I'm, I'm speaking in particular of Pasquotank County. They had the school that opened up uh, out there at the Elizabeth City State University campus and uh, they're doing a great job and as a result of that, uh, and I'm in the schools all the time, I, I, I like to spend time in the classroom a day at a time when I can get there, sit there in terms of greeting the bus, being with the teachers during the classroom, doing lunch duty with the teacher, and then saying so long to the kids as they take off on the bus. That's the only way you can ever get a grasp of what's going on. A lot of us that are in the General Assembly, what we, when we think about education, we think about us who, we were in classrooms with 30, 32, 33 kids, there was one teacher, and there were never any problems. Oh, you always had the one problem kid where the teacher might turn over his desk on occasion or something. But, generally speaking, everything was under control. So you've got legislators, remember most of the General Assembly is a part-time legislature. A lot of legislators are still in this frame of mind. They cannot understand why, gee, it worked for me. I can't understand why it's not working now. But you have to go in and you've got to sit down and you've got to work with these teachers and then you understand this is not the same classroom that we were in. It's not just fast forward 40 years. When you've got technology and all of these other things, not one teacher can handle all of this. That is why teacher assistants are so critical, so vital. Uh, they're not an extra. They're needed to help educate our kids. But the funding component, education is a three-legged stool. You've got federal dollars, you've got state dollars, you've got local dollars. Here in Dare County, you've got a, lo a lot of local dollars that are going into education. In Currituck County, they have a significant amount of local dollars going into education. Some of these other counties don't. And so they don't have the tax base themselves. Remember, it's a three-legged stool. They don't have the tax base to be able to do the kinds of things that need to be done in terms of increasing teacher supplements and so on and so forth. What happens is, that is why it is critical to have economic activity and opportunity at whatever level. You need to bring it in because those are the folks that are going to be paying tax dollars that are going to, that are going to go into the county coffers in these small rural counties and, uh, and it's going to help them. North Carolina, I don't know what it is with the exact percentage is, but in public schools it's close to 40% of the budget goes through K-12. K if you want to include the university system, now you're talking upwards of 60% of the budget. Now, that's education. What about everything else the state funds? Where's the money going to come from? So, we've got a situation that needs to be addressed in a very, very delicate way. We need all of the stakeholders involved. We need to talk about this. I don't, I don't agree with you that we're losing teachers across the border. North Carolina, we may lose some, but we're not, they're not leaving an exodus, and I can show you some numbers to back that up. Nobody is going, because in Virginia, let me mention this, in Virginia, they don't have the same benefits that our teachers have. Our benefits are more lucrative. Our retirement benefits are more lucrative. Our hospitalization is more lucrative. And I've had many Virginia teachers tell me, hell, I'd rather be working in North Carolina. We've got to pay for this ourselves and pay for that ourselves. You don't do that. 20 years as a teacher, 25, you're out. And you're a young person, if you choose to be. And you're a young person, you can go out and find another career. 
and you're going to have those benefits there. They can't do that in some of these other states. So there's a lot of things we're doing well. It's like anything else. We've got 115 LEAs. That's uh, uh, you know school districts. 115. They've all got different struggles. They've all got different challenges. One of the things we need to do. You don't have that problem right here. I don't think in there. But one of the things we need to do, there's a lot of these schools, you talk about trying to get money in for teacher salaries and so forth. We've got infrastructure that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. We've got Camden County schools are bulging at the seams. Now we managed the General Assembly, we managed to get Camden County two and a half or three million dollars toward building their new high school. That new high school is 35 million dollars. They can't float a bond at Camden County to cover that kind of expense. The taxpayers couldn't pay for it. So lottery money needs to all go back to the schools. Lottery money needs to be all used for capital improvements, primarily in those rural counties that are struggling, that don't have the tax base to be able to do the kinds of things that need to be done. Mr. Twain, would you agree with trying to get the lottery money back into that, but at the same time, you're, you have you'll have a student who will be sitting here at County School. How do you feel like you, as a senator, could take what Bear County has as a school system, yep. get it to spread across the rest of the as being in the state, so get it to spread across the rest of the district? Yeah, guys, it's a good question. What, we talk, what we're really talking about, teacher salaries, and I know there's some teachers in the room, so I don't want to talk about them like they're a third person. There's the one sitting right over there. There's one of our teachers at First Flight High School. She had a great handshake. God, God, God. Yeah. I asked her what she did. I know. Like, where'd you get that? Um, guys, how do we get great education for our kids? And obviously, we all agree that education is really expensive, but probably not as expensive as ignorance, and we know we got to fund it. But it's probably a disservice to our teachers to say that it's all about the money. I bet it's not to that lady over there. I bet she does it for another reason. Some of it is money. Let's pay our teachers everything we possibly can because they're investing in the future, our children and our families. Let's not pay them more than we can afford because we can't do that. Let's also look at alternatives in the terms of the education system. We talk about charter schools. Everybody know the smallest public school in North Carolina is up in Curry Tuck County in Corolla, who's the first charter school in northeastern North Carolina. It's busting at the seams because it's different and kids had a choice, mainly parents had a choice, maybe the kids didn't, to go there. And that's important and those teachers are great. So we've got to pay teachers as much as we can. I used to work for a guy in the military named Stan McChrystal. And a lot of people say soldiers and sailors and airmen and marines are heroes. And Stan McChrystal said, one day in this country, when teachers are regarded as every bit the heroes that our men and women in uniform are, we will have arrived as a country. And I agree with that 100%. Now, having said that, we've got to do fund them as much as we can, but not more than we can afford. So we've got to figure out what we can afford in some of our rural counties. We talk about an urban-rural divide, the best counties in the state right now. No surprise. Where are they? We've got a lot of good ones in there. Best ones in the state, Raleigh and Charlotte. That's where they are. We got to figure out a way to fund our teachers to the maximum extent we can. We're going to need some help, but we're also going to need choices. We're going to need investments in infrastructure, but we're also going to need to make sure that our teachers are well respected as much as we can. Ultimately, this comes down to kids in the classroom, and we talk about that, we talk about parents. So I think we can never separate those kinds of conversations. Bottom line, let's pay our teachers as much as we possibly can, and let's invest in the future, but let's not pay them more than we can afford because that doesn't work for anybody. And I, I'd like to jump in if I can on that just for a second. I think when we're looking at salaries, we have to recognize that we, uh, there are a lot of state employees that we, have to, that we pay, and we're, we're very grateful for their service. We've got folks working in our prisons now that are working for peanuts and haven't seen a raise in years. We've got folks in the ferry system that are working for peanuts and haven't seen a raise in years. We've got a shortage in highway patrol people. Take a look, you're not getting the kind of coverage that you should be getting over here in Dare County, nor are we in Northeastern North Carolina. We're losing a lot of good people because we are no longer, or we haven't been, we've been neglecting, looking at other areas where we can raise pay as well. So teachers, I'm all for, we're gonna continue raising teacher pay, and, uh, and I'm all for it. But we also, everything has to be in balance. Other state employees are just important as North Carolina to North Carolina as any other state employee. One, because they all perform a vital function. In the prisons, they keep us safe. Nobody wants to work in a prison, 
You certainly don't want to go and work in a prison today, the way they are today, for 30 grand a year or $32,000 a year, that's for sure. And that's why we have the shortages, because we haven't been addressing those concerns. Sometimes some groups are more vocal than other groups in terms of making their demands and so forth for teacher, or not for teacher pay, Gordian slip. Some groups are, you know, are more vocal. And, uh, and so the squeaky wheel, you know, gets the grease. But we need to be fair. We need to take a look at all of our state employees. They are all vital to this state's economy. Every one of them performs a vital function and we need to respect them and we need to show that respect by paying them money that is not just basic pay with no increases. How do you pay for it? If you want to go to a zero state tax, how do you pay for it? There's only one way to pay for it. You've got, and you mentioned it earlier when you were uh, in your opening remarks, there's only one way to pay for it. You've got to broaden the tax base. The tax the, uh, there's, oh, there's billions of dollars in untaxed revenue in North Carolina. It's called the underground economy. It's there. Billions of dollars. We're not tapping into it. People that don't pay taxes. So we can't, if we're going to keep this economy growing, we can't raise our income taxes because that's going to do just the opposite of what we've been accomplishing for the last six years. So the only way you can do it is you broaden the tax base. By, use, by user taxes and so forth. Not everybody likes them, but if we're not paying anything in state income tax, zero, we get to that point, you would expect, as Florida and Texas and Tennessee do, all of these folks, that's how they do it. They broaden the tax base, you capture this underground economy, and with this underground economy, you have increased revenues coming in, which are going to help you fund all of the things that need to be funded and we're talking about salaries in this particular case, vis-a-vis -vis the entire state. I want to keep it balanced here because this we could, I mean, you and I, we could get into this topic for a moment. I want to make sure we get a chance to answer. Sure. So I'm going to ask this question. I want Mr. Twitty to answer it, and I may come back to it when we get everybody a chance to answer this. How does user Republican support? And they call it user. It's still a tax. It's the word is T-A-X. It's still a tax. You call it a user fee, a user, whatever you want to call it. It's still a tax. How do you support guys? Guys, so there is you know, the state is us. We have a government that's of, by, and for us. It's our state. We get to decide how it's run. We get to decide what we want to pay and what we don't want to pay. And when we give up our money to the state, we get a voice in how it gets spent. And I think generally we would all admit and agree that we don't want to pay anything more than what we have to because we probably all agree that the government that governs best is the government that governs least. So we got to talk about what we can actually afford and we've got to talk about what we need and you hear this conversation on needs versus wants and things like that. Ultimately it comes down to groups just like this and to your credit Sam having conversations just like this to determine what we're willing to pay for. Guess what? There will never be a day when none of us don't have to pay taxes if we want the kind of government that we do want and roads and education and things like that that we use every day. But we also don't want a government that taxes us more than we think is fair because we work hard for each and every one of those nickels and dimes that we send to Raleigh. And I think that's just important. Ultimately, Sam, to answer your question, it's groups just like this. Ms. Boswell, how do you as a Republican support adding more taxes? Sales tax, user tax, sales tax on the way. We talked about this earlier in the discussion. How do you support your public support? Well, once again, we are going to, an in hopefully, our game plan is to have zero income tax. And as Bob was trying to explain, we are broadening that base so everyone pays, the consumer pays. What I, and that doesn't limit you to the rich pay, the middle class pay, the poor pay, and that's the idea. Everybody is given into the state, so everybody is given into the economy, so everybody is providing for services. That was the game plan and that was the premise of the zero income tax and then the broaden the base. And nobody likes taxes and fees and permits, and I'm well aware because I hate it every time I write that check. But we do want those services. And we do demand them and we should have those services each and every I mean every one of us because we deserve those so I'm all in for I'm for it 
Less is more. I absolutely agree with less government, but we have to have a, a base to pay for our services. Mr. Schreiber, you brought it up, so I'm going to go to Mr. Hannon and I'll come back to you. Sure. Mr. Hannon, how is your Republican support more taxes as we've talked about? Labor tax as opposed to having this, uh, a state income tax? It isn't a more tax. What, is, what does a tax do? A tax pays for your basic safety, your child's education, and the welfare of your community. Okay? Uh, with, with that said, everyone should have the same thing. Everyone should feel just as safe as the next person. It doesn't matter if you make $5 an hour or $50 an hour. How do you do that? You tax sales. It's not about the income tax. It's about paying for what you use and that's fair. And a fair tax is the way to go. So I'm all for that. That was Steve Forbes' idea, as you know, was the, uh, was the fair tax. And uh, there are a lot of people, uh, libertarians and republicans, that feel like uh, that is the way to go as far as the, the future is concerned. So that everybody, as uh, Representative Boswell stated, so that everybody has got some skin in the game. Everybody is utilizing the services that the state provides at one level or another. Everybody. So why shouldn't everybody be paying? And they should. And that's that's the problem. We, nobody should be getting a free ride in this state. Nobody. Everybody can contribute something. And, but you will control your level of contribution by your appetite for goods and services. Not just those required goods and services that you have to have, but your appetite for maybe the newest and the latest in a cell phone. Or, or some other sort of gadget. You determine if that's important to you and you purchase it, then by golly, you should be paying something on that. Not just getting it for free and let the guy that's working every day out there slogging in the mines every day, paying for your lifestyle, and you've got no skin in the game. That's not right, it's not fair, it's not America. Let's move on to the environment, and I'm gonna take the opposite end of well, some people would say that. Some people would say that commercial fishermen are to take everything and don't drill. Really and then we can get into wool drilling and bags and that. And that's going to be our next thing. But with marine fishermen, I'm going to start with you, Representative Boswell. Would you support the request by the Marine Fisheries Commission to dissolve itself, blow it up, and start over with how we regulate marine fisheries in this state? And I'm talking about the division and the commission. Would you support throwing it out and starting over right now? Actually, when I met with the new secretary of DEQ, we had some good conversations. And he admitted he went up to par on commercial fishing, so I felt obligated to teach him about commercial fishing, but I had some good people with me. I had the Oregon Inland Task Force and some um, Dare County commissioners with me, so I had the right information, and he was eager to learn, so I was happy about that. Um, the question I asked him was, why are people regulating commercial fishing that know practically nothing about it? Take for instance, uh, let's use the bar. The bar determines how the attorneys go about their business and if they need to be corrected or educated or have their license suspended or taken away. The bar decides that. Okay, that's their industry. They're deciding that. Go on down all the way to a tattoo artist. They have their own industry and they correct and control their industry. So why is a source way out here that knows nothing about commercial fishing trying to correct you on your fishing, trying to tell you how to fish and when to fish or why to fish when they don't know themselves? When I went to Raleigh this year, they didn't even know what a trawl boat was. Well, I have a painting in my office. I took it off the wall and showed them what a trawl boat was. They don't know what gill nets are. The majority of the people think fishing, you still throw a rod and reel out. And that's great because we want those fishermen too. The biggest thing we've done in Raleigh is to educate. They want to make the right decisions, but they need the information and the education. I can't thank the Dare County Commissioners, the Oregon Inland Task Force, and the other uh, fishermen that have come to Raleigh. 
and knocked on every door of every legislator and talked to them. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and thanked me for them coming. Uh, so I'm all for self-regulating industry just like everybody else. I mean, real estate, on down to barbers, they have their own group that controls their industry. I think we need a commercial fisherman group that says, hey, Captain George right there is not fishing properly. Let's re-educate him on what he's doing wrong and we'll sanction his license, whatever, whatever they decide. Then if he doesn't do right, I'm gonna have to take his license. I think we need to be a self-regulating commission. All right, with that said, how do you balance what essentially is a public trust resource between the recreational fishermen, and I'm not talking about the recreational fishermen that live in Raleigh and come down and get in their boat once a year. I'm talking about the recreational fishermen who just happens also commercial fish. He's wanted when he gets home and says, Hey, I'm gonna go out here and throw it off the dock. How do you how would you balance it? How would you figure out a way to regulate taking a public trust that the commercial fishermen need for their livelihood, but the recreational fishermen have a right to catch and to enjoy and to take home and eat dinner? Our water is our public trust. And our commercial fishermen are our original conservationists. Do you think they would go out there and rape their land? Well, I always say farming and fishing is the same thing. It's just a different uh, water instead of land. Do you think they would rape their industry that they make their money off of? No, they would never do that. And I've heard from the CCA and other groups that, oh, there's poachers that do this and oh, there's, but there are bad people in every group. And that's why we need our, our own commission and our own governing board. But we don't, we've never asked a uh, recreational fisherman to stop fishing, unlike the other way around. We've never asked them. Matter of fact, we encourage them. We want them to come out and fish. And they're gonna have the same rules and regulations as all the fishermen. I mean, there's, there's no difference. Water, commercial fishing, we want everybody to fish. And if water is a public trust, and DEQ will still be DEQ. Mr. Hannig, how would you find what? What do you? What would you do? What, if you were right now already in Raleigh, what would you do now? The Marine Fisheries Commission said, "Pull us to, to dissolve us, and kick us out." The, the, the first thing I would do is, is take the appointment of the Marine Fisheries out of the hands of the governor. The, the governor has, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, the Republican nominates these people for these. These folks for this position uh, that is that is unacceptable to me there are too many public interests there's too much money being thrown around that that needs to be taken out of hand of the governor our commercial fishermen are our original business in North Carolina any any legislation or any attempt to limit them or to take anything away from them will be fought tooth and nail as long as I'm a representative in the state of North Carolina they are folks that supplement their income that they make they make a little bit of money to supplement how they are paying for their child's education and by slowly regulating them and taking away from them we're making it harder and harder and harder so let let's be real about it what what these folks are trying to do is eliminate the commercial fishery and we are not going to let that happen they are too valuable of a resource in the state of North Carolina, and everything we need to do to protect them, we must do. There is a balance. There's a lot of water out here. We have almost 10,000 miles of estuary coast. There is enough for everybody. What it's going to take is, is some people with some guts that are going to sit in the same room and have that conversation that aren't going to be all the way over here, it's commercial fishing or nothing. All the way over here, it's recreational fishing or nothing. There's a way to meet in the middle, and cooler heads have to prevail on that. And it's going to take some folks to come together to get that done. President Steinberg, you live in an area that's seen a commercial fishing industry die, the herring fishery. It's been, it's died. We all agree. <laughs> Do you agree? Do you think it's time to end how we regulate fishing in this state and rebate? It's not being regulated well right now. The, the question was initially, you, you, you asked, do I think that... Uh, to blow the commission up. Yeah, to blow the commission up, or to let the governor uh, appoint a, a new members of the commission. That was actually... That, that was, that, right. that's true. <laughs> but, yeah. and, and a related topic is, should we just completely say, 
get rid of it the way we do it and come up with a different way to do it. Well, here's the problem. If we allow the governor just to go ahead and take these folks that are already on the commission, throw them all off and replace some others, we're going to be in the same situation we're in right now. The commission is out of balance. The commercial fishermen are at a very distinct disadvantage. I was at the midget folks today in uh, Snug Harbor looking at their Stumpy Point, rather. Yeah, Snug Harbor's up my way. Yeah. Stumpy Point. <laughs> looking at uh, Looking at uh, their operation, they've got a brand new sea uh, food house that they're, they're opening up and uh, so obviously they're bullish on the future and they think that uh, you know there's a, there's a future for commercial fishing. But this, this situation we've got right now in the Marine Fisheries Commission, these boats, they know what this boat is on any issue before the meeting is even called. It's, it's, uh, there's been all <coughs> sorts of uh, alleged violation of open meeting laws and so on and so forth. So the die is struck before these people ever come together. When you've got fishermen and people packing a hall, three, four, five hundred people packing a hall, all opposed to one particular initiative, and then you see this board in a very close vote go the opposite way of the interest of all these people who have packed the room, that is when, my friends, you know you've got a problem. And we do have a problem with the MFC. Now, I am the only member of the North Carolina General Assembly that sits on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is the Coastal Commission. That's all of the states up and down the coast. They know there's a problem in North Carolina. You talk to these folks, even CCA people from other states, not the ones that are here necessarily, but CCA folks, they know we've got a real problem here in North Carolina. And the commercial fishermen aren't getting a square deal, and it's and it's wrong. One of the best things that happened. You remember the game? I mean, you weren't there when we had the game fish bill. Do you remember the game fish bill? It was his commission. No, no, no. But the game fish bill. There were some people in the legislature who were trying to, you know, pass through these lobbyists that were working for the CCA get a game fish bill in place. This game fish bill would have absolutely crippled beyond repair the commercial fishing industry. Now, here's what happened. The CCA had a tremendous, they've got tremendous reserves of uh, uh, money that they can spend. I mean, these are the fat cats. These are the guys, some of them are good guys. Some of them are supporters of mine. But the fact of the matter is, these are the big money people. They hired the most influential, it was Brubaker, the most influential <laughs> lobbyist, this guy used to be Speaker of the House, to represent them on this game fish bill. Now, commercial fishermen don't have any money to speak of, Brownie, except for you, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they don't have a lot of resources. But what they did do was, they, and uh, Representative Boswell alluded to this on another bill, they came up in mass, in mass to the legislature every day this game fish bill was being considered and believe me the game fish bill was in the bank the votes were already there this was a done deal all of a sudden buses start arriving we're looking at folks walking around the general assembly that there are a lot of guys that look like santa claus i mean these were these were a different group of folks but they were the salt of the earth folks and they had their families in tow and they were knocking on these doors of these legislators. And I'm going to share this with you. It's one thing to be looking at a bill and to studying the finances of the bill and saying, you know something, if commercial fishing just doesn't contribute that much to North Carolina's economy, look at what the, if we put all of our emphasis in recreational fishing, it would be much better. And you know something? As far as the numbers are concerned, that's exactly right. However, that's not the right thing to do. Now, when you're sitting in a legislative office, it's one thing to be scrolling through numbers and, yeah, this makes sense. But when you've got that family sitting across the table from you who has been in business their third generation, fourth generation, this was the original industry in North Carolina on the coast, fishing. And you're looking at these people, and you're looking at their eyes, and you see the concern and the pain and what the fear 
the absolute fear of what's going to happen. And this is all I know. This is all I've ever done. But that vote that never came to a vote. Legislators were bailing out in caucus. I can't, I can't do this. I can't support this. They had the heads counted, all the folks, they had the votes. But once these folks came up, staked out the ground, came in, did the hard work, game fish bill never passed. So the power still remains with the people. If folks will get off their duff and get to Raleigh or Washington, if they're concerned enough and passionate enough about an issue, the power is still yours. It doesn't belong to us. You don't kiss the ring. We kiss you. You're the boss. We work for you. That's the way it is. But somehow that's been lost in Washington, and it's becoming that way in Raleigh, too. This is the name of the game today, folks. Right here. This is it. Money. 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 You got the money? The votes are going your way. This is one case when the little guy won, and to that I say, thanks be to God. We can, if we spend two hours in lobbying our phone, y'all want, we can do that all night. I wouldn't mind doing that sometimes. <laughs> Mr. Twitty, what do you think as far as how we're managing fisheries in this state? What do you think you've done definitely with that, if you were elected? Guys, uh, my little sister Hadley, many of you might actually know her. She's a commercial fisherwoman up at Kerala. She hauls crabs out of the Great Tuck Sound with a guy named Buddy Ponton. Buddy's been doing it for 40 years. So I've never done politics, so when I started to go down this road, I went and saw Hadley. And I actually asked her to come tonight, and she said, heck no, the drummer running an ogre coat. So she drove by right as this thing was going on. So it's all right. Yeah. So here are the two principles that I think are really important. And when I went, this, went down this road, this is what Hadley said. Number one, we need to make sure that fishing is sustainable in North Carolina. And number two, we need to make sure that more people in North Carolina eat more North Carolina seafood. And if everybody, and if we agree on that, then all the, the bills and the Marine Fisheries Commission and all those things are tools that we use to achieve those principles. So I asked Hadley, hey Hadley, how hard is it to catch crabs? It's dumb. we got to fix it. All right, well how do we do that? I generally am in favor of less government. I'm not opposed to blowing up the MFC. Having said that, I've never been in politics before. I kind of like the idea of getting rid of some folks in Raleigh. Now, having said that, I also see the opportunity when things that are entirely unregulated have a tendency to kind of be a fall in the slaw, so to speak. And the example I use is Airbnb and HomeAway right now. Not regulated, unlevel playing field in North Carolina that's hurting the biggest employers in Dare and Curry Tuck counties directly every day. So do I think it might be time to get rid of some folks in Raleigh? Yep, but let's agree on two principles. Fishing has to be sustainable in North Carolina, and the first people who agree with that are our commercial fishing men and women. My sister would be furious if I let her out. And we have to agree as a people that one of the things we need to talk about is, let's eat North Carolina seafood and not shrimp from Vietnam or the Philippines that don't have any regulation. Let's eat our own food. And those are the problems. I want, to make, I want a quick answer because we're running short on time. I don't want to talk about I can keep y'all here all night because I have, I'm, I love this stuff. <laughs> quick answer, quick answer. Putting a consu consumers, and I'm talking about people who buy it and people who sell it, and I'm talking about selling the restaurants. So we're putting them on Marine Fisheries Commission. Agree? You think it'd be done? I actually like the idea that the Marine Fisheries Commission is made up of the entire spectrum of users, from folks who catch it to folks who sell it to folks who eat it and, and restaurateurs all in the middle. There's lots of restaurateurs in this room who serve shrimp and, and fish. Yes, it's a short answer. I agree. We are all stakeholders in North Carolina. Do you think it can be done? Could, could it be something that could be done with what you're having to do with? With the fairness and the, uh, I don't have a lot of faith in the MFC. I don't have a lot of faith in the appointments and I don't have, uh, seats can be bought, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Steinberg, what do you think? Well, it's a, I think the last statement you just made, seats can be bought. There was one gentleman on the MFC who was, the, now this is out of the words of our former governor, Governor Pat McCrory, was the biggest pain in the rump, and he was causing most of the problems. We don't need to mention his name. Most of us don't even know who he is. Yeah, okay, he was causing most of the problems, and we thought the governor, his term was going 
on the right. budget. The right. term was right. expiring. Everybody contacted the governor and said, do not reappoint this guy. Don't reappoint him. But this is what I'm saying, folks, about money. Somebody, and I love our governor, but somebody got to this guy, and it was just a couple of weeks, three weeks before the election. Yeah. And he went ahead and he reappointed this man for another four-year term. And I think that is one of the things, and I think Brownie would agree, that's one of the things that hurt him in the election. Because this guy on this MSC board is, is trouble. I mean, he's trouble for the commercial fishermen. He's never going to give them a nod. Uh, he's, he's just... Exactly. But now we're going to deal with them for another four years. So, so but do you agree putting user groups, be putting the consumers and the restaurants, putting a seat on the no problem with that, even if we broaden it, but have all the stakeholders at the table so they can talk about it. But you still need to have a fair balance of folks. You need, you know, the, you need the recreational component that's got to be there. CCA is going to have to have somebody, whether he's actual CCA or not, or she, on the board. But the we need open dialogue is what we need. We need to be able to, I tell these folks all the time, the commercial fishermen are very, very supportive of me, but I say to them, look, there's going to be a time when I am going to come to you and I'm going to ask you, in the interest of making concessions, to make a concession. But I'm only going to ask you to make that concession if the folks from the other side are willing to make a concession too. Because if just one group is walking away with all the marbles, that's going to be nothing but a disaster. Everybody's got to give something, and we need to, and everybody should be able to prosper in this industry. There's too many rules, too many regulations, too much scientific, so-called scientific information that the guys that are out there every day fishing, and the women, will tell you is, it's bull. Mr. Hannon? Well, one thing is clear, Representative Steinberg does not listen to instructions. We were looking for a short <laughs> answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I agree that the consumer should be involved in, in the process. The only way that can happen is to take that power away from the government. Um, environmental issue number two. Sorry, you brought up a good point. 400, 500 people gathered in New Bern when we were talking about the shrimp trawl situation. We've had county commissioners meetings, we've had rallies, we've had all these different things. In Dare County, Currytuck County, all in you know, every county. All but two counties, or all but one county has passed a resolution. One county passed a resolution that was basically neutral, that would run to the county. All shoreholders are. These people, four, five hundred, six hundred, we talked about that, it seems to be more that way. All these county commissioners. How can you, and this is part of constituent services, and I'd like to get to that, I wish we had more time because I would love to get to that, but how can you go to Raleigh knowing behind you, those people behind you don't want offshore drilling? How can you go to Raleigh and tell the speaker and the president pro tem, hey, we can't have this out, how do you do that? It's easy, it's easy. If you were out there and you were listening to the people in your district, in any given area, and they tell you, we don't want this, then I'm representing them. We don't want it. I'll give you an example. You can talk about offshore drilling. Let's talk about the plastic bag ban. I never, other than HB2, received more mail than I did on this plastic bag ban. Now, when this ban was put in, I was not in the legislature at the time, but I can tell you I would not have voted for it. It had nothing to do with Senator Bass tonight. I just wouldn't have voted for it. It, would, it didn't seem like a good business thing to me to, to vote for it. But fast forward eight years, and you've got every township, every piece of correspondence you're getting is saying, people are coming to my office. I don't even represent Dare County. And I've got the commissions and commissioners, and everybody is coming to my office and saying, do not. Do not repeal this plastic bag ban. We like it. Well, you know, I stopped it in the House. We didn't repeal it. But what happened at the end, whether you like the bill or not, it was tucked into another bill that we could not debate. When the bill came out of the Senate and it came over to us, all we could do was vote yes or no. And in that 
bill was repealing the plastic bag ban. And sadly, for those of you who are sad to see the ban, you know, taken away, that, that's obviously, I think, most people uh, in Dare County, judging by my mail. You've got, you've got a situation where in that particular point in time, I had no choice but to listen to the people. And if you're listening to the people, then you're never going to go wrong on any vote. The people are the ones that are going to tell you how they feel and if they are passionate, we talked about this before, if they are passionate about something, if this is what they want or this is what they don't want, my job in representing you is to go to Raleigh and to represent you. You don't want it? I'm going to do everything I can to stop it. You didn't want the plastic bag ban? I'm going to, there were articles down here in the local media. I was interviewed over and over and over again about this ban. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, it didn't need to be a piece of legislation that even needed to be toyed with. There was no reason to even bring it up. I mean, it was fine. Things were working fine just the way they were. You didn't need to do anything with it. Why create a controversy over something that is not even controversial in this county? So, there you go. Okay. And it's tied together. I'm glad you brought up the bag thing because it is tied together. The world's really in the bag thing are tied together because of the way that the people that you represent feel about it. I want to let Mr. Twitty answer because I'll give you the opportunity. I want I am going to let you, but I wanted to keep it as far as set it in the house. So, do you support, obviously, with your business and you come out and say, wool drilling, possibly finding a way to bring plastic bag man back into some other form, whether it's local legislation, allowing local legislation, which require rewriting the state constitution. That's fine. Would you support that? How would you go about it? But at the same time, representing your constituents on how they feel. That was a long question, guys. I know. So I'm going to take this. Because radio guy, I love to talk. <laughs> I'm going to do this like an apple pie. I'm going to eat it one bite at a time. So, but I'll be short because I know we've been sitting in these chairs a long time. Number one, when you go to Raleigh, I think you got to vote your conscience, you got to vote your constituents, and you got to not surprise anybody by doing either one. And that means you got to communicate all the time. Nobody expects to be unanimous on anything. All the right, all the truth, and all the angels are seldom on the right side if we're being honest. So, having said that, let's talk about drilling. With drilling, we got to talk about definitions first. We all agree. I bet every single one of us in this room agrees the natural environment is the most important thing of the Outer Banks. We all agree on that. So when we talk about things that could potentially threaten that, let's start with some definitions. Drilling, oil or gas, we got to figure that out. Are seismic surveys related to that? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe they prove that we don't have a problem. But also, at the same time, we need to make sure as a community what we're saying no to. And I think we all agree we probably don't want them here. There are some people who argue revenue sharing supports our inlets and supports beach nourishment. We need to make sure what we're saying no to, just like each one of us does every day when we choose what to spend money on and what to not choose to spend money on. In terms of the natural environment, I think the bottom line is we have to agree that our natural environment is the most precious thing we have here on the Outer Banks, whether you're in the agriculture business, the fishing business, or the tourism business, and all the businesses that support those kinds of things. We have to be measured when we go about things that involve impacting that, but we also have to be honest about practicality. What's a practical approach to that that balances people in our environment? That's a short answer. Okay. Representative Boswell, how, how do you not no. I think you roll your eyes. You haven't got to the question yet. Yeah. I thought it was the same question. It is the same question, but it was going to play off when we had the discussion. So it was obvious the way that the bag ban was, and, and now also all drilling, because they're kind of related to each other. Got local governments that are opposed to change, opposed to change the ban, and then were opposed to all drilling. Made that clear. How would you have better handled how people interact? You and people are right as far as the band goes, but at the same time, do you feel like plastic you can, bag? Plastic bag band. And also, how do you feel like you can go to Raleigh, represent people that elect you to tell and convince the speaker and the president, the president pro tem to come online with what the coast and what, what the majority of scenes what the coast wants to do is protect the coast and not have more. First of all, let's make a lot of things abundantly clear tonight. I don't think I have um, been giving clear representation with the plastic bag ban uh, repeal. 
My plastic bag ban repeal was never even heard in committee in the House. So it never went to the floor to get a vote in the House. The attorneys looked at the appeal, the uh, plastic bag ban uh, repeal that I had, and there are some people out there that were going to have a lawsuit against North Carolina because it was unconstitutional. An unconstitutional environmental bill means if a plastic bag is bad for Manio, it's bad for Raleigh. If it's bad for Timbuktu, it's bad for Charlotte. So an environmental bill has to encompass the whole state. You don't get to pick and choose which areas you're going to ban the plastic bag. So when the environmental bill was sitting in the Senate, the Senate encompassed it into the environmental bill in a conference report. The conference report comes back, just like Representative Steinberg said, a yes or a no. And that's how that came about. Do I still support it? Yes. We have a littering problem. And it's not just plastic bags. I can pick up uh, probably about 100 beer cans just on my way home in the, um, not even to mention the cigarette butts, which are really, <coughs> really disgusting. Uh, so we have a littering problem. So we have an education on littering. So I have a resolution that's going to be read into uh, the short session. It's called Don't Mess with North Carolina. And it's about littering. It's about littering and how we're going to partner with NCDOT and other uh, separate entities in the state to educate people on littering and what to do and how to recycle. So don't treat the symptom, treat the problem. So let's put it into littering and not just a plastic bag. So it's an environmental bill that proved to be unconstitutional, took an oath to uphold the Constitution of North Carolina, and that is my job in the House of Representatives. But at the same time, if it was ever taken to challenge court, you can't then prove that it wasn't a constitutional angle of it. How do you defend going to Raleigh and supporting something that your constituents, the majority of constituents, support? the county board of commissioners, the local governments came out and said they were they they were opposed to the repeal. They wanted to keep it. How do you go? I support justice? free market. I support if you want a plastic mm -hmm. bag, a paper bag, or a recyclable bag. That's up to you. It goes back to education again. And I had business owners ask me to work on this, and I did. But like I said, it never even got heard in committee, never went to the House floor. None of us ever voted on it until it came back from the Senate in the conference report. And I was not a conferee on the conference report, so you can't hand that one on me either. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I did have something. Yeah, we don't know. We're not for this. Bobby, um, how do you feel like you could listen to what your constituents are saying if you're signed wrong and tell the speaker and tell Senate President Pro Tem to come on board and oppose offshore oil drilling and maybe possibly bring him back in about it if it was and if there was a way to do it. And I know that's a deep subject that we can get into our love to wish we could. But would you support that? I'll make this how as, as succinct as possible. We have a three billion dollar tourism industry in North Carolina. That doesn't even include points west that actually help our tourism industry. We have almost a two billion dollar fishing and commercial, recreational and commercial fishing industry. I am never going to support anything to do with our coast that would damage our coast. I am never going to do that. Our way of life revolves around our waters. There have been 140 communities on the east coast that have put out resolutions opposing offshore oil exploration, drilling, fracking, whatever you want to call it. There's a reason for that. There's a lot of data out there that we don't know about. In its current state, we cannot afford to take that risk. I will not go against my constituents on anything. You are the ones that I work for. You don't work for me. I'm going to go to Raleigh and I'm going to defend what is important to everyone in this room and everyone in this community. That's what's important. That's what you left me to do. When I go to Raleigh, I'm taking 82,000 people with me, or give or take. So that's where I am with the offshore oil drilling. 
The bag ban, again, when you have every elected official body telling you don't touch it, don't do it, and you still do it, when you have citizens that are surveyed, when you take a survey of 500 citizens and two people say repeal it, you don't touch it. You don't move it forward, you don't do that. You do not go against your constituents. That's what we're here for. We're here to serve you guys, everyone in this room, and everyone in this community. And that's what I will do. You will always have a voice with me, you will always be heard, and I will do what my, what my constituents want me to do. I have some very strong conservative values. Oil and, and natural gas independence is crucial for this country to stay a leader in the world. There are many, many resources we can tap before we have to go off our coast. And we have to exhaust all of those resources before we even touch our coast. And that's what I have to say about that. All right, lightning round. Let me just lightning round. Quick hitters. Quick hitters. I just want to kind of a yes or no. I want a yes or no. Really, it's a yes or no. Okay? <laughs> Truly a yes or no. All right? Although we can yeah, I, I wish we had all day to do this. The state going into the dredging business. Would you support the state going into the dredging business? Absolutely. How would you pay for it? Sales tax. Mr. Steinberg. I'd consider it, yes. How'd you pay for it? There's any number of ways. We've got a big budget, it's $22 billion. We can find some money to find. We can find the money. Conference report just, let me just add a report that just came out. I'll make sure I'm right. Just had a report that came out that laid that out for you guys to discuss the short session. As, as far as the dredging. Uh, the dredging it, was yeah, it, was, it was a massive document. I mean, I see it not finished. We're trying to go through it and figure out how we can come up with a story and summarize it. Yes or no? Support dredging business, state wanted to the dredging business? And how I'm going to have to expand on the yes. Um, yes. Absolutely. And it's, no. public, public, <laughs> <laughs> it's a public private okay. partnership. Okay. All right. have, but you would support oh, you kept me oh, on. You kept me on. Oh, you kept me on. You're not running against Bob. I don't know. But no, I'm saying, I just want to, that's all. Yes, and how to pay for it. Public private partnership. Okay. And there's money that uh, is available. Okay. Right. And there are talks in the works. Okay. That's, that was where you were going. I think. Was that where you were going? I was going to expand a little okay. more, but that's good. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. okay. Okay. I think we ought to talk about that. We need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Floyd. Yes, public private partnership. Okay. Uh, how about Oregon Inlet itself? Using the GOP's control of Congress and the White House as of this very moment. The legislature's already done a study on acquiring the property that is Oregon Inlet, the, north, the southern. The, Southern tip of Body Island, make it a state park. Would ha, is it possible to go to Washington to push the Department of Interior to see its control of Oregon Inlet to the state and therefore allow the state to put jetties and stabilize that? Mr. Steinberg, I'll start with you. Okay. Would you do, would you do that? Do you think it could be done? I don't know whether it could be done or not. Uh, to be honest with you, I'd like to give you a very candid yes. No, I don't know whether it could be done. I think it, like everything else, needs to be examined. We need to take a look at it and, and see what the benefits are, the pros and the cons. But I don't have a vote for Washington. But, I, but I'll tell you what I do have in Washington, and that is the legislative assistant that worked for me for four years is now working in the White House with Donald Trump. So I have ears at the very highest level. And, and I'm happy to have that access. And when that conversation, if that conversation should take place, I know I've got someone that's going to get me to the years I need to be. It's possible you think it can be done? I know it can be done. There's talks into partnering with um, some local mm -hmm. people here for jetties <clears throat> and groins, and there are permits awaiting. Um, beach nourishment and dredging is a band-aid. We need another element to keep our stability and safe waterways and our beaches as um, beautiful as we can <coughs> make them. So there is uh, a process in place that I've been working on with some other officials and some some local people as well. And it's um, turning out pretty good in our talks and we're moving forward and there's gonna be great talks in this short session. Do you feel like Mr. Tweedy that you could that with the control as it is right now with the White House of Congress of the legislature to, to bring our deal under state control and, and do things to stay well? Well guys we all know that anytime you deal with the federal government it's not gonna be easy. And it's going to take time and it's going to take money. Having said that, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. 
And I think at some point, uh, our maritime highways have to be under control of North Carolina. We've got some federal waterways. We can learn a lot from Hampton Roads and how they treat the ports and their access. I do think we need to start at it. It's going to take years, but it's a good way to go. Mr. Chairman? Absolutely. It, it can happen. The first thing we have to do is get a pool together and get someone to purchase a Southern Environmental Logger. <laughs> so that, that's our issue. Uh, it, it isn't about regulations. It, it, it's about special interests trying to keep us from doing what we need to do. Yes, it can happen. And yes, I will. We can all for it. Last question. The Alligator River Bridge. I talked to the governor two weeks ago when he was here and asked me, of course, it's a very local issue to Raleigh. We know it's a statewide issue because I get my Twitter blows up every time that bridge fails for people who live in Raleigh and Charlotte and Asheville and Greensboro and Lincolnton and Murphy <coughs> and Swain County and wherever you want to talk about in this state. People in the same business that I'm in, in, in the broadcast industry, they come to the Outer Banks and how do they get here? The Alligator River Bridge. That's the only way they know. They don't come to us the same. But there's so, even there's even more there's 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 another important component to that, and uh, Mr. Twitty alluded to this earlier. Getting the folks who have to come over here to work every day to work right. every day, they're expecting them to show up. If you can't get across the bridge, you got a problem. He's got people who live in Terrell County. All the ministers. It's got to be a major County point of emphasis. Okay, so how can you, as a legislator, Mr. Hanning, force the issue to get the Alligator River Bridge? replacement knowing that it's not part of the STIP because it's not new construction it's replacement construction but at the same time the legislature took out the political process and the process of the state but this is one that now is a major concern for the outer how do you feel like you could get the Raleigh and get that bridge replaced faster you have to personalize it you have to talk about exactly what these folks have talked about these folks have to get to work you need to make these stories personal and everyone needs to be involved in it. It isn't just a legislator going up there. It isn't just a senator. It's all of us getting involved in that and beating that drum every day. And that's what it takes. It takes getting involved. It takes everyone in this room to come to Raleigh, to call me, to call your legislator, to call your senator, to get involved and make it personal. Now, Jerry Jennings at the MT said it'd be the end of the year before the environmental document will be done for the overall U.S. 60 project. So that puts us into 2019. Very well, two of you may very well be sitting in Raleigh in 2019. Two of you may not. Well, in fact, no. Oh, two of you may not. Two of you may not. That's real. That's real. Two of us two will be, will be, two two will be in Raleigh in 2019 right. when that environmental document comes. Mr. Steinberg, you think as a senator that you can get that bridge pushed somehow in the Hudson? Yes, I do, and I say it unequivocally, and let me tell you why I can say that. That mid Currituck bridge. 35 years they've been trying to get that mid Currituck Bridge built. I went in in 2012. The commissioners from both Dare and Currituck, this was almost my sole objective over the first couple of years in the legislature. They said it couldn't be done. Bill Owens wasn't able to get it done. Senator Bastai could have got it done probably if he wanted to get it done, but it, but it wasn't done. And I don't mean that as any slight. The fact of the matter, it wasn't. We've got it done. Funds are appropriated. It's ready to go. It's within the five-year step. The problem we have right now is the same problem that held up the Bonner Bridge, and that is the Southern Environmental Law Center. We have gone through all sorts of hoops, all sorts of hoops when we were originally doing, even as recently as 2012 and 13, trying to get this thing done with this uh, with this mid Tech Bridge. But you know something? Now, those folks, that group, and the money's there, everything's ready to go, that group wants us to go through the hopes again. There might be another polywog that we've got to, you know, before we can build this bridge. I'm all about nature. I'm not a tree hunter, but I respect nature. But that bridge, you talked about earlier, Bobby, Currituck County is one catastrophe away from becoming a small, rural, with very few resources county. Dare County is one step away. 
We can't get people off this beach, off the beaches, with an, with, with a, a, an environment, not an environmental disease, well, yeah, that too, but a hurricane or something. We're in big trouble. And it takes years to rebuild that. You look at the billion dollars plus that comes into Dare County, just Dare County alone in tourism, and you've got a catastrophic incident like this happens, we can't get people off the beach. There's nobody coming to Dare County anytime soon. I saw it up in Minneapolis, Minneapolis-St. Paul with the bridge collapse. There was a delegate to the Republican convention up there in St. Paul. The bridge collapsed the week before we got there, and it was an absolute disaster, not just at that event, but for the next year in terms of the economy for those two cities. So you got to pay attention. So getting that bridge built, you can make that a priority. Uh, it'll, it'll happen. Part. Yes, it'll happen. Ms. Wagner? Well, first and foremost, I think you need to bring to everyone's attention and all of the safety issue. Safety is key. Each and every one of us have to remain safe. I, then comes the work, and it does. <coughs> I've been stuck on that bridge, I can't tell you how many times, mm -hmm. and it is not a pleasant thing. I found what works the best for me because I have brought Raleigh leadership down here on multiple occasions. It's good to actually lay eyes and make it personal. To read about it, to see it on, on a piece of paper or a slide, it's a whole different story when you actually bring them here. Let them see for themselves. This is our way out of town. This is our way into town. Once they see that it is a true safety uh, uh, safety issue, it goes up in priority. And what you do, bring the leadership down. Bring DOT down, the leadership DOT. Let them see. Let them go across that bridge. Let them be stuck on that bridge. And let them talk about a hurricane coming or the flooding issues. Then we'll have a lot of relevance. And they'll look at it a lot closer. Guys, I think we'd agree. What the heck is going on with our bridges right now? Why does it take so long? And how are they closed this time of year? We got to do a couple things to fix that. They got to go faster. And we also have to educate folks across the state. The Broken Bridge and <clears throat> Alligator Bridge and the Curry Tuck Bridge, it's not a Dare County issue. It's not a Curry Tuck issue. It's a North Carolina issue because our tourism affects everybody in the state and the Mid Atlantic for that region. These projects have to be done. There is going to be some inconvenience, but they got to go faster. And it's not a Dare or Terrell or Curry Tuck or Camden issue. It's a North Carolina issue, and it needs to be prioritized accordingly. We're all tired of wondering how our bridges take so long and are repaired so frequently. Whether it's Oregon Inlet, whether it's the Alligator River, whether it's Curry Tuck, they all seem to be under construction at the same time forever. It's got to go faster. We've got to educate more folks. I want to thank everyone for putting up with us for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Steinberg brought it up before. People don't realize 11 counties. How, do we, how many square miles roughly? All I can say is just look at it on a map. Yeah. Look at it on a map. I have just since uh, this campaign began, let's say since January, uh, close to 10,000 miles on my car so far. January, that's three months. Yeah, three, you know, months. I measure this district in cups of coffee and Bojangles wrappers. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of them. But and it's you a, go buy a lot more Bojangles wrappers that direction. Mm -hmm. this direction yeah, exactly. right. Guys, it's a big district, but it's big because people are leaving, and we got to make sure it's getting smaller over time. I've got a good buddy of mine running for Senate right now in Union County. He can get anywhere in his district in 20 minutes. And the reason for that is there's a lot more people going to Union County than there are in Northeast North Carolina. And if we're not careful, folks, and east or west rather of I-95 may not have to listen to us anymore. Just as a function of population, we need to make sure that we have to see at the table we'll be on the menu. Call it the Berlin Wall. I call it every time I cross 95, I tweet crossing the Berlin Wall. It feels like that. Well, in, in 2021, I think, 2021, 58% of the legislature, 58 to 60% of the legislature is going to come from six counties. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a hundred counties in North Carolina. Right. Imagine that. So it's going to, you've got to, you're going to, your representatives are going to have to be a, someone who is able to go up and fight for what we need here 
You can't go up there and just hope they're going to give you a little piece of the pie. You've got to tell them a story, you've got to make it personal, and that is how you get things done even when you're not in the majority. That's how you get things done. Ms. Boggs, how many, how many separate, you both of you can answer, how many separate districts do you cross to cover your entire district? Think about it. Because it's the four eastern counties of North Carolina, the four most eastern counties that have except Carter how, how many, listen, it's, if I count it right, it's three? Uh, at least two house districts you cross? House we one? The largest, largest house district. But the, the, largest, largest, district. the largest, but you've got to do that. <clears throat> that that's, it, it just, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. It, it is very mind boggling. And like you say, we've got to bring industry, we've got to bring jobs back because we need to bring our children back. These rural, health, these rural counties need all the assistance that they can get and all the incentives. And we need to be recognized. And it's very hard because that population is right there in the Mex and Charlotte and Wake. And but, so we have to knock really hard, speak really loud to get recognized. But that's fine. I can do that. We can do that. And we have done that. We wouldn't be having these projects going on now in DOT. And uh, we're going to continue to work hard for Eastern North Carolina and keep us on the map and keep us in the minds of the other legislators in the General Assembly. Well, I'm going from the most northeastern county of the state, and I drove to the most northwestern county two weeks ago. We had six hours from here to Coleman. It's eight, eight hours from here to Coleman. It is four hours and five minutes from where my district starts to where my district ends. Wow. Four hours and five minutes. What's really cool about it is you get to meet such a diverse group of people Everyone has the same issues, but it all comes down to it. How are you going to put food on my table? How are you going to get my kids educated? That's what it comes down to. How are you going to keep me safe? But learning about all the other industries and all the other folks that are in this region is special. Everyone in this region is special. You feel a, a sense of place everywhere you go because all these folks are the same. They have the same needs and the same wants. And it's, it's a pleasure to drive down there. Really is. And 49% of our population now in the state of North Carolina, it's got the numbers have got to be a lot higher here, but 49% of our population were born somewhere other than North Carolina. And North Carolina is now the ninth largest state in the nation. We crossed the 10 million individual barrier, if you will, threshold, and, uh, and, and we can't stop the folks from coming in. I mean, everybody wants a piece of North Carolina. They want to be a part of North Carolina. They've heard the success stories. They want to come. And we're not going to be able to keep them out. And we don't want to keep them out. But our state is not the same North Carolina it was four or five years ago. If everybody here had to raise their hand who was born in North Carolina, I'll guarantee you it would be split maybe at the best. In Deer County, I'd be willing to bet most people were not born here. So. Changing dynamics, and we need to address them. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you
traditional dance. I think they were the